prime time local news serving the lakeland and midwest regions good evening thanks for tuning in an increase of the municipal tax levy is on the table as city council has been presented with the first draft of the 2022 budget for more on the factors that are influencing the budget here's jace mackey Lloydminster taxpayers are facing a 3.5% increase to their municipal taxes after City Council had their first look at the proposed 2022 budget. The pandemic continues to have a negative impact on the city's finances, but the newly negotiated RCMP salary agreement and less grant money coming in from the provinces also hurt. We were facing a 6% increase alone into taxes with the RCMP's salary uh, approval from the federal government. We're facing a $3.1 million less grant from the government of Alberta, and we know, know where Saskatchewan lies. The draft budget includes funding for ongoing capital projects in the city, such as the wastewater treatment plant and upgrades at the golf course and aquatic centre. There's also money going towards a new recreation complex to replace the Civic Centre. We know the Civic Centre is reaching a point in its life. It's still very safe to use and it'll be used as long as possible, but at the same token, we don't build a new arena in one day or one week or one year. So those are the planning things that need to happen. Mayor Gerald Albers acknowledges that many residents will not be happy seeing an increase to their tax bill, but he says the city has done their best to keep the increase low, focusing on funding the city's needs while trying to find cost savings. This is a very much a maintenance budget. Uh, we don't, we see some items being replaced, but at the overall basis, this is not uh, an enhanced budget. When we look at the numbers of the past, we're very much on the capital needs and operations continue to strive for improvement and uh, trying to find those cost saving measures. The mayor says there will continue to be challenges for the city moving forward, but he hopes the economic situations will improve for the provinces and that will trickle down to the city. With $80 a barrel oil in it, it's still improving that the fiscal condition of Alberta will change and that will result in an improvement of support from the province to municipalities, including ours. Again, the same with Saskatchewan. They're experiencing some record high levels of prices of potash. Oil is up and uh, uranium is starting to pick up. So again, I always again look to hopefully be positive with the provincial governments, but uh, it is tough when they balance or try to balance their budget on the back of the municipalities because at the end of the day, the same taxpayer that has elected the provincial government is our taxpayer. Council also debated the possibility of including funding for a transit study in this budget. This is still a draft budget and Council will revisit it on November 22nd. For our primetime local news, I'm Jace Mackey. Service members and government officials gathered at the Royal Canadian Legion to mark Remembrance Day yesterday. For more on the ceremony, we throw to Jasmine King. This year, the Remembrance Day ceremony at the Royal Canadian Legion was held virtually as only a smaller amount of people were allowed to attend in person. Wreaths were laid by members of the Legion, which represented different governments, Silver Cross mothers, veterans, and more. A good turnout from the local veterans and uh, Legion members showed. Um, it was nice to be able to have people come back into the building uh, for the service, even though you know, we couldn't be as large as we usually are but we're going to uh, hopefully be there next year. We can have a, a full service. So. Local government officials were also in attendance to pay their respects, including Mayor Gerald Albers and MLA Colleen Young. And in their 100th year, Mayor Albers touched on the significance of the poppy. If I asked you, what does the poppy mean to you? You know what you would say. If someone asked me, I would say the poppy, like the one I'm wearing, represents the remembrance through its moral and financial supports for our veterans years after their service. Additionally, it's a sign of support for our veterans' families and a grateful nation. Even though this year's ceremony was scaled back, Scott emphasizes the importance of remembrance on all days, not just November 11th. People are... Um, they're reminded every day of it by the news and what have you of what's going on around the world, but because it isn't directly affecting them at home, they, they step back, they don't really understand that we do still have Canadians that are putting themselves out there, RCMP, etc. They're, um, they're still doing it every day for us. So. Our veterans aren't 
all 90 years old. Our veterans, we've got veterans that are in their 20s. Jasmine King, Primetime Local News. Now for a look at weather heading into the weekend, here's Jay Smackey. Well, thanks a lot, Tate. And uh, as we take a uh, first look here at your weather, currently in the border city, we're sitting at minus five. It was a pretty cloudy day today, and as we head into your weekend, temperatures will stay pretty consistent, but get a little colder as we head into the next week. We're also sitting at uh, minus 13 if you look at that uh, wind chill. Taking a look now at uh, conditions across central Alberta and Saskatchewan, you can see that things are a little bit warmer into Alberta, and as we head into, into Saskatchewan, sorry, things get colder. So zero degrees up in Athabasca, one degrees in White Court, minus five in Cold Lake, and here in the border city, two degrees in Edmonton, three in Edson, six in Jasper, and five in Rocky Mountain House and Red Deer. On the Saskatchewan side, like I said, slightly colder, 10 degrees out in Melfort and uh, Prince Albert, 7 in uh, Meadow Lake and uh, 7 as well in Saskatoon. And we don't have any temperature reporting right now from North Battleford, but the last time I checked it was also sitting at minus 5. So overnight tonight in North Battleford, cloudy day today. Overnight it's going to go down to 11 degrees and things will be a little warmer tomorrow with a high of 2 degrees uh, overnight tonight there is a chance there will be a little bit of snow coming through the North Battleford area and that may continue into the day tomorrow. That's much the story for across our region as well. Cold Lake right now is also sitting at minus 5. Overnight tonight things will cool down to minus 10. Before warming up to 5 degrees for your day tomorrow, there is a chance that there will be some uh, flurries tonight in uh, Cold Lake as well. But it's not going to be much that by the time it hits the ground it will probably melt. Taking a look now here at the border city, 5 degrees uh, right now. Overnight tonight things are going to cool down to 12 degrees. and Minus 5 as well is uh, the daytime high expected for tomorrow here in the border city. So as we take a look now at the next three days here in Lloydminster, we have uh, a nicer day tomorrow, 6 degrees uh, for the high there, minus 8 for the low and a little bit of sun peeking through as we head into Sunday. There's a chance we could be seeing some uh, either mixed precipita precipitation or flurries, high of 2 degrees and a low of minus 7. 2 degrees is also the high as we start your next week with a chance of either uh, precipitation or flurries and we'll uh, be seeing some cooler temperatures as we head throughout the rest of the week. So that's your first look at weather. We'll be back with more news after the break. Welcome back. A group of local businesses have raised more than $15,000 for families in crisis since launching their efforts in February of last year. To learn more about the operation, I spoke with two of its members. The Bianahan Project is a local fundraising initiative led by a group of Canadian Filipino businesses and their goal is to raise money for families impacted by loss or severe illness. So joining me today from the group to talk about their efforts is Leo Aguinaldo as well as Jonah Ramirez. So just off the bat here, I wanted to ask how this coalition of sorts kind of came to be as well as maybe what the motivation was was behind the Bianahan project originally? It started in uh, February when a Filipino family here in Lloydminster um, needed financial help for a medical um, um, a medical uh, thing that they have with their family. And so um, a lot of us um, who own um, small businesses in town, Filipino Canadians, um, come up together and we decided to just throw an online uh, raffle draw using Facebook. So mm -hmm. we got other businesses in town chip in for prices. And then we, we did have 100 slots, 100 spots for, for, um, for that particular, particular draw. And from there, it, all started. And in regard to the families that the group is helping to support, what kind of impact has been made so far and how are you guys raising money? Okay, so what we do is we collaborated with several organizations here and abroad, here in, in the Philippines. So we identify families who actually are in deep need of uh, financial assistance for medical and um, general services. Uh, that's when we decide which family gets to be our beneficiary. And then we communicate uh, the message to uh, the Filipino business owners group here in Lloydminster. 
is when we decide when and um, how how many slots do we have to um, to you know to to open for for this particular draw. Say if uh, the illness is very critical, then we tend to give more slots for um, uh, for sale for up to ten slot. Yes, mostly ten. Mostly bucks. ten bucks, and that's where we actually get seats and we hand them to our partner organizations and the partner organizations hand them to uh, hand and the money to uh, the benefit uh, beneficiary family. And for people who might want to check the project out or maybe even make a donation, where's the best place for them to go online? So uh, right now we have our Facebook page. It's called Buy a New Hand Project. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's all over uh, the map. And um, our main location right here right now is the Highlander Stores and Services here in Lloydminster. Um, I would like to make mention that we have helped Probably about a dozen families so far, and we have we have raised fifteen thousand dollars for for all the families that we have uh, we have been helping and we have helped since February of last year. So um, other than that, our number is my number personally is three zero six eight three zero six one seven seven. You can call me or text me anytime, and Jonas' number is um three zero six eight three zero nine two five eight. Or you can message you can message us in Facebook as well. Yeah, and we are in the process of uh, reviewing related literature because we would like to formalize this as a not profit or not for uh, not profit organization. So um, we are in the process of incorporating this so we could widen our scope of services not only here in Canada but even abroad uh, in the near future, hopefully. Thank you both so much for doing this. Welcome back. Most of this year's crops are already in the bin, but as farmers know, pest management is a year-round job. For more, our Jillian Code has the interview. Today I'm joined by Rachel Malenko with 2020 Seed Labs. We're talking about Fusarium, which has been on the rise in the Lloydminster area over the past few years. Now, Rachel, I know most of the crop from this year is already in the bin. So looking forward to the 2021 season, what are some preventative measures that farmers can take to maybe help protect their fields a little bit? So um, the number one thing is right now, farmers um, and growers to get their seed tested for a Fusarium infection. Um, to know if they have it. And since it's been um, deregulated as a pest in Alberta, it's really up to the industry and to individual um, farmers to assess their risk um, on their own and um, as an industry in general to um, reduce the spread of it. So if you take a look at um, the maps that 2020 Seed Labs produces, the Fusarium um, Graminarium Infection map, uh, that's updated monthly. And we actually have a subscription service where we send those updated maps by email, um, it's called our uh, the incubator. So you can actually sign up for that um, by contacting myself, Rachel, or on our website. And if you're coming from provincial counties where Fusarium graminearum is not already established, so we're thinking about Northern Alberta counties or sometimes um, certain areas in the foothills, they haven't, um, graminearum hasn't really been established there. Um, we recommend getting um, a DNA Fusarium test um, opposed to the traditional plate test because this is a quicker um, turnaround time for results and it's a bit more sensitive as well. So um, you'll get re your results and if you do end up having a positive DNA result on that, then we also recommend um, continuing on to the plate um, method because that will actually give you your percent infection. So then that result, your percent of Fusarium graminearum infection is really going to drive um, what your best management practices are going to be for reducing that spread in your own fields and in um, other uh, growers fields if you're going to be selling that seed lot. Um, so if you're coming from counties where um, definitely Fusarium has been established, so basically everywhere in Alberta besides some northern um, and certain counties as well where it hasn't been established yet in those production areas, um, we definitely recommend if you know that there may be a chance of infection on your seed to immediately get that plate test because that will um, determine your percent infection because um, you already know that you there may be a chance that you have it. So um, once you know your infection, um, there's certain 
a couple different steps that you can take to manage it. So definitely using a seed treatment is um, step number one before spring planting. Um, using a diverse and long crop rotation. I know this is repeated for almost every disease, but there's a reason for it. And it is because um, it does really, really help to drive that reduction of disease and spread of uh, Fusarium graminearum. So we're thinking a two to three year break from your main host crops. Um, so we're thinking about cereals and um, even corn um, drives some of that Fusarium graminearum spread. So um, educate um, growers on that kind of crop rotation. Um, there's Fusarium uh, head blight resistant varieties on the market right now. So that could also be an option if you're thinking about um, purchasing a new seed lot and uh, thinking about future varieties. So if they find that Fusarium is already in their fields, what can they do? If you are in a, that production area where Fusarium is quite a big risk to your field, um, we want to be thinking about also spraying fungicide at uh, head timing for fusarium, fusarium head blight. Um, and this is kind of where um, our best management practices come in. So we um, do offer the um, Spornado spore catcher service. So um, it's a passive spore catcher and it will be um, placed in your wheat field. And after a few days um, around your fungicide um, timing, like uh, between bolting um, to uh, head timing, uh, we can take the cassette out of the Spornado and analyze it at our lab for um, the, the detection of fusarium spores. And that um, result is really going to help farmers uh, make the decision on whether to spray or whether or not to spray at head timing. And then also help um, time the application as well. So that's where um, some of the other services that we offer can really help managing this disease. Um, and then also another thing is to um, keep educated on um, the tracking and spreading of fusarium in Alberta. So that's where, our, again, our maps and our data from the lab can really help um, producers in those areas. Absolutely. Thanks so much for chatting with me today. Now, let's take a look at some agriculture prices for today. Lakeland College Athletics have been playing ACAC games since September. This weekend marks a new chapter in their season. For more on the Rustlers volleyball and basketball teams that will start their regular seasons this weekend, here's Evan Kenny. Rustlers fans, the time has finally come. Following successful preseason campaigns, the Lakeland basketball teams will host Concordia here this weekend, while the volleyball teams will travel to Edmonton. The last time a Rustlers basketball team saw league action was moments before COVID-19 struck. The women's team had just secured ACAC gold and was off to nationals. The volleyball teams are each coming off 2019-20 playoff berths. For the men, this was their first postseason appearance in 12 years. The women's will look to continue their success, being led by 2020 ACAC Rookie of the Year, Janae Varga. As of this week, fans are allowed in the stands with a proof of vaccination and a mask. Evan Kenny, Primetime Local Sports. Now it's time to check in once again with Jace Mackey for your second look at weather. Thanks a lot, Tate. And uh, as we take a look right now at our satellite and radio map, you can see a lot of activity. There's uh, some flurries that could be going through the area, and that uh, kind of purpley color is freezing rain. So it could either come down as snow or freezing rain when it hits, uh, starts getting frozen as it hits the ground. So we'll be watching that as we go throughout the forecast tonight. Taking a look now, though, at uh, current conditions across our region, starting on the Alberta side. 
We'll uh, look up at uh, Lac Labiche. They're sitting at uh, minus three right now. Same as Bonneville. Minus five up in Cold Lake. Two degrees out in Edmonton. Zero in Baggerville. Minus two in Vermilion and Wainwright. And minus one down in Provost. Turning to the Saskatchewan side now, we see minus three up in Alacrosse. Minus six in Green Lake. Minus seven for Meadow Lake. Minus four for St. Wahlberg. Seven. Minus seven, sorry, down in Maidstone and uh, minus one for Macklin. Here in the border city, we're sitting at minus five. So as we take a look now at overnight conditions for across our region, pretty consistent across as we see uh, nothing too crazy. Uh, minus 12 overnight tonight in Meadow Lake and uh, Paradise Hill. Minus seven in Alacrosse, minus 10 in Pierceland, minus nine in Bonneville, minus 11 in Unity, minus five in Provost. Miriam is sitting overnight tonight. They'll be seeing minus six and minus five overnight in Wainwright. Taking a look at the region for your day tomorrow, a little bit warmer than we were seeing today. Six degrees in Lloydminster and Maidstone, minus, or two degrees in North Battleford, eight degrees in Macklin, uh, one degrees in Meadow Lake, and as well up in Alacrosse. Taking a look now at the Alberta side of things, we see uh, eight degrees down in Provost, nine degrees in Wainwright, seven in Vermilion and Vagerville, eight in the capital of Edmonton, four degrees in St. Paul, five in Bonneville and Cold Lake, and six degrees up in Lac La Biche. Now taking a look at temperatures across our country, 12 degrees out in Vancouver, 2 degrees in Edmonton, minus 8 in Regina, minus 2 in Winnipeg, 8 degrees in Toronto. And as we head through into that uh, more eastern part of the country, 5 degrees in Quebec, 1 degrees out in St. John's and 3 in Halifax. Now taking a look at the next seven days here in the border city, we have a pretty mild uh, weekend. And as we head into your next week, things start to really cool off. So uh, Saturday, we're going to start things off with a pretty warm day. Some sun peeking through the clouds. Six degrees is your high with minus eight being the low. There's a chance we could be seeing some snow on Sunday with a high of two degrees and a low of minus six. There's a chance we could be seeing some either rain or snow as we start your week on Monday with a high of two degrees and a low of minus six. And then things start to get cooler as we head throughout the week. So three degree, minus three, sorry, for the high on Tuesday, minus five for the low. And then really things start really getting cold on Wednesday. We'll be seeing a high of minus eight and a low of minus 15. There will be a chance we'll be seeing that sun peeking through and the sun will continue to peek through into Thursday where we have a low of minus 14, a high of minus four. And then we wrap things up looking at Friday with a low of minus five and a high of minus 14. That is your look at weather. We'll be back for more news after the break. Today I'm joined by Jim Taylor from Grinding Gears to talk a little bit about their ski and snowboard swap coming up this weekend. So to start, could you maybe tell me a little bit about what's going to be going on this weekend? Yeah, uh, this weekend we've got our first ever ski and snowboard swap, uh, equipment swap going on here at the store. Uh, it's going to be going on Sunday between 12 and 6 p.m. And so for the swap, will it be open to anyone who just has gear that they want to get rid of? Or I guess, how will the swap work? Yeah, the idea is that uh, we get lots of requests for uh, good used gear um, throughout the year. And we always have uh, a trade-in program from the store already uh, with youth that are growing. So we take stuff back on trade that uh, each year that kids are growing out of. So boots and bindings and boards. Um, and primarily we've been a snowboard shop. This year we've, uh, we've added ski uh, downhill ski equipment to our store uh, and that's just expanded uh, we see other communities uh, Edmonton uh, Saskatoon North Battleford is our closest that hosts uh, an equipment swap night and uh, there hasn't been one in Lloydminster for years um, the last one I remember was over 10 years ago that I can recall and so I wanted to do something I wanted to do a swap uh, and give that opportunity so the uh, the parents and and uh, people out there that have you know, equipment in their garage that they're not using anymore, they don't know how to sell it, maybe the social media apps aren't working to sell, uh, this gives opportunity for them to come down, uh, it's open to everybody, there's no uh, fee to come down, it's going to be held in my old location, and um, and yeah, come on down, check out what's going to be here, and uh, if you have stuff to sell, we're going to be doing a, uh, offering a consignment, so we can sell it for you, there'll be a little fee that's going to go towards donations to uh, Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Lloydminster, and um, so, yeah, there'll be a consignment option if you want it, or I encourage people to stay, sell their stuff, trade it, um, and yeah, try to try to get new homes for your gear and maybe find some some gear upgrades that, you, that you're looking for. So then I, you talked a little bit about it before, but where did the whole idea to have this swap come up from? This year, um, 
there's two things that really kind of sparked us to do it is that we've we've done it in store uh, trading with product that we've sold, um, but requests from our customers looking for uh, you know gear for their kids, looking for stuff that maybe isn't brand new pricing that's still really good shape, um, and and that being that being said, nobody else or there hasn't been another uh, opportunity. We don't have a replay store. We don't have that other stuff that's going on anymore. Uh, in our area. So I figured, why not? I've got the space. I just expanded. So I've got room. So why not dry it here so we can oversee it, be here to help people, educate people on what they have, maybe what it's worth. I'm not sure what to sell it for. And we're going to be fair. And um, I think that's the biggest thing is trying to be, be have a nice, fair, easy place where, you know, you can bring down and uh, help people get rid of stuff. The other one is, um, I hear it all the time is my garage is full. The closets are full. I don't know what to do. Where do I get rid of this? And it's not always easy to sell through social media or maybe people aren't comfortable with, you know, people coming to their, their garage to, to see what they've got or meeting after hours. So this gives a nice kind of open atmosphere um, where you can come in and, and like I said, make those connections, make those trades and, and find that gear. And then I guess, what are your expectations for the weekend? How do you think the swap will go? Well, I think uh, this weekend it's, we're going to get a lot of people that maybe miss it. You know, we, we only decided a week ago to hold it this Sunday. Um, so I, I'm anticipating that we're going to get a request to maybe do another one. That's why I wanted to hold a, you know, a small, I know it's only six hours, but it gives that opportunity to start somewhere. If it goes off great, great, maybe we can hold another one, or maybe we can do it the new year again, when uh, our season opens and, you know, Mount joy opens and table mountain opens. Um, but we will have, uh, Mount joy, uh, representatives from Mount joy will be here and Mount representatives from, uh, table mountain. Uh, and the, T uh, the Table Mountain Ski Club will be here. So offering information about our local hills and the local clubs that are around. So with those guys coming, I expect a few, maybe a few more people to stop in to say hi, just to get information, maybe get it season passes. Um, so I think it'll be pretty good. We're gonna, like I said, it's a small time frame. It's only 12 to six on Sunday, but um, you know, we can get a lot of people in and out in that amount of time. Uh, that's great. That's all the questions I had. Is there anything else you'd wanna add? Um, we are doing, we're accepting drop-offs, uh, at the store on Saturday, the 13th between one and six. So if you're, if you aren't able to make it to the swap and you have stuff to sell, um, then, uh, I encourage you to drop it off at that time. We'll record who's going to be, uh, who's dropping it off and what your asking price is. We'll do our best to sell it fairly for you. Um, and we're also going to be accepting equipment donations. So if there's equipment that you're not sure. Uh, if it's, you know, worthy to sell, or maybe you just want to donate it, we're going to, we will take that equipment, we'll clean it up, and we will get it ready to sell. And again, we're going to be uh, taking that as a donation, and offering uh, any proceeds from the sales to local charities like Big Brothers. Uh, and I hope we can even maybe make a dent and, and uh, contribute to the uh, Mount Joy Magic Carpet uh, fund that they're trying to raise. So again, it's just the first idea that I thought I'd throw it out there. This is our first Sunday being open again at the new store now that's expanded. So why not kick off the winter season? We got some snow today and people are getting excited talking about it. So it's kind of all just coming together, make it happen and, and go from there. It's great. Thank you for taking the time to meet with me. Coming up next Friday, November 19th, it is going to be a treat for your taste buds as Savor makes a return to Vermilion. This event is a come and go event, so you can drop in between 7 and 10 p.m. and then you'll be able to sample some different beverages and they're going to pair them up with delicious finger foods so that you can enjoy a really fantastic night out. Advanced tickets only for this event, but there are still tickets available. So if you'd like to get more details or get your ticket, go to the Good Life Institute .ca. The Festival of Trees is back this year. It's going to be held at Lakeland College coming up on Thursday, November the 25th. Now is the time to get your ticket so that you're in for a glamorous evening as you celebrate the trees of Tinseltown. The evening features a delicious meal, then an opportunity to bid in the live auction on a number of beautifully decorated trees. There's also going to be a silent auction as well. All proceeds go to the Richard Larson Bar Colony Foundation. Tickets are available now. You can get them at Olive and Burke in downtown Lloydminster or give Pam a call at 780-205-9433.
And the Nest Project is getting set to launch their Living Well series for November. The first session is taking place on Tuesday, Choosing Joy. Then on Thursday, you can take part in Embracing Self-Compassion. And coming up November 22nd, there is a session on Presence. And some of these sessions are online and some are in person, but there's no cost for you to get registered and attend because of a partnership with the Thorpe Recovery Center and Project Sunrise. To get registered, you can go to LloydminsterMentalHealth.ca. Well, whatever you choose to do this weekend, we hope you stay safe and stay healthy. What's Happening is brought to you by Northern Factory Workwear, Circle Drive East, Saskatoon, and Highway 17 South, Lloydminster. Joining us today for this week's entertainment panel is the lovely Abby St. John. Thank you for taking the time to speak with us. Of course, thank you. Yeah, of course. We got some interesting topics for today. Starting off, we'll be talking about uh, Wicked, the movie, how they did cast the roles for Glinda and Elphaba. Now, we have Ariana Grande and Cynthia Rero. This is going to be very interesting because there is some talk about how people are thinking about how they're going to do for the roles of this. I haven't, you know, seen the Broadway myself, but there are a lot of Wicked fans out there, and they're very excited to see this. So we're gonna, it's going to be interesting to see what this is all about. Yeah, I think uh, I think the casting is perfect. Um, I uh, I think a lot of people agree as well. Um, I think obviously Ariana Grande, she's a huge pop star, and um, she has she has a fantastic voice and beautiful range. And same with Cynthia Erivo. She she's won a Tony. She's gotten a couple Academy Award nominations. She's going to be in the uh, the new Disney li uh, live action of Pinocchio playing the Blue Fairy. So she's been around and I think it's just the perfect casting for both Alphaba and Glinda. Um, now they took to social media to announce it and they both sent, sent each other praise through uh, flowers and you know Ariana Grande she said Cynthia Honored doesn't even begin to cover it. I cannot wait to hug you see you in Oz and then Cynthia sent her flowers saying congratulations Miss A the part was made for you I look forward to sharing this musical journey with you so it's you can already tell that the chemistry is going to be fantastic and it's going to be they're just going to be great together Wicked on Broadway is now the most it's the most popular Broadway show that there is, it has brought in over a billion dollars in revenue. Um, and Christian Chenoweth, with, who originated Glinda on Broadway, she posted um, praising our, uh, Ariana Grande as well, saying, I'm not sure if I've ever been this proud. From the very first day I met you, you were destined for this role. Congratulations, Ariana Grande, the best Glinda you will be with Cynthia Revo by your side. So having the original care, uh, actress who plays that character send praise I think it's a good call um, I think the casting is perfect and I'm very excited to see the film I haven't seen the musical which I've been dying to see um, so I'm hoping that the movie is just as good and Wicked fans are excited to see it because this will be a movie for them because how long the musical has been on Broadway and just how popular it is this movie is definitely for the fans so I'm excited production is set to start next summer as it was delayed so we won't be seeing it for a while but uh, it is very exciting that they have cast the two uh, two main characters. Yeah, it's going to be really fascinating to see it and just knowing like, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, Ariana Grande myself, knowing that, you know, I think they'll be doing a good job when it comes to this for Wicked. So I think it's going to be good uh, seeing that there is some people that may not think they are, you know, age appropriate or anything like that. But I think they're going to do great, especially with their singing voices and everything like that. But moving on to some fans that, you know, may be fascinated with like darker subjects, of course, with uh, what concerning documentaries. Um, this is on Jim Jones. Now, he is the 1970 religious cult leader who was behind the Jonestown mass suicide that took over 900 lives for anybody that was a little bit interested in that you know how crazy that story was there is going to be a movie in the works of with Leonardo DiCaprio starring as him so this is going to be fascinating because as I was reading upon it he's also supposed to be helping produce that 
Yes, he is the producer. Uh, he's one of the producers, and he's also been uh, cast as Jim Jones, who is, like you said, uh, who was the leader of the Jim's J- Jonestown cult, um, who, like you said, or- orchestrated one of the biggest mass suicides in history. It claimed over 900 lives, and 300 of those were children. So it's a very dark story, uh, you know, There were several survivors of it, and they have recounted through documentaries just the horrific um, stories that they had endured in their lives um, throughout all of this. It happened in 1978 when the massacre happened. So it's going to be a very hard movie to watch. I've watched a few documentaries on Jonestown, and just just hearing the stories, it's very hard to listen to, very hard to watch. Um, it was just a huge, huge tragedy that um, is now coming to the big street big screen through a movie and Leonardo DiCaprio will be playing that cult leader. So I'm pretty intrigued uh, for this film. And I think Leonardo DiCaprio, he has massive range. So I think he is a fantastic choice for this, uh, for the role of Jim Jones. So it's going to be interesting. MGM um, is, uh, is the main production house and there's no really uh, set a uh, release date set, but the movie will be directly based on the real life tragedy and the events leading up to the mass suicide. So I'm intrigued for when it comes out for or even for when we get a trailer for it, um, just to give a little bit more insight of what we can expect, but it will be directly based on the tragedy and, um, the, and what led up to it. So if you're not familiar with it, uh, definitely check out some documentaries but it this is going to be a very interesting film yeah from what i was seeing especially on youtube when i was checking out uh one of the main documentaries i think was by real stories um it was really scary to see what that was all about when it came to that mass suicide and it was really hard to watch but i found it that it was very you know interesting and for people that want to look more upon it i i say as well to check out the documentaries but it's really cool to see as well with uh, leonardo like how much work he puts into it with like projects and how he was going to be the main star of it it's going to be really interesting and i've always thought leonardo was a great actor myself so i'm excited to see when this comes out but that's all the time we have for today unfortunately once again it was great talking with you abby you too That's all we have for right now, though there is some more news coming up in the next hour, so you can stick with us for that. But for right now, I'm Tate Laycraft. Have a good one.